I love this time of year when we start getting non-conference schedules coming out, and we got two of them today, Ohio State and Colorado. You are Locked On College Basketball, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, what's up? Welcome into the Locked On College Basketball Podcast, the only daily national college hoop show out there. I'm your host, Isaac Shade, and you're joining me at The Place to get your college basketball content every single day, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Thanks for making us your first listen or watch, and I want to remind you, you can get every episode ad-free on Amazon Music. Check it out. Special shout out to all you everydayers out there and all the members of the Locked On College Basketball Discord. This episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and redeem code Locked On College for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Coming up on the show today, like I said in the open, we're going to take a look at Ohio State's non-con schedule. Most of it, there's an omission, and we're going to look at Colorado's less than stellar non-conference schedule, and then Oklahoma out here doing Locked On College basketball dirty. We just talked about them. And now they're adding all these dudes. Come on, Porter Moser, what are we doing? And Florida State gets the most Florida State big to reclass that you could ever imagine. Let's dive right into it. Um, For those of you watching on YouTube, you're going to get a little uh, visual aid here. I'm actually going to pull up the Ohio State non-conference schedule so that you can Watch it and follow along in real time. Uh, But never fear to all our audio audience. I'm going to read this bad boy off as well. Ohio State's non-con kicks off on Monday, November 4th. Opening day essentially for college basketball against Texas in the Hall of Fame series in Las Vegas. Then on November 11th, a week later, we get Youngstown State coming to Columbus And then November 15th at Texas A&M, that's on a Friday night. Love a good Friday night game. 11-19 versus Evansville. 11-22 versus Campbell. November 25th versus Green Bay. November 29th versus Pitt. Thank you for that. Uh, December 17th versus Valpo. And then December 21st, that's the CBS Sports Classic. They'll be playing Kentucky. Uh, that's at MSG at Madison Square Garden. And then wrapping up the non-con will be Indiana State on December 29th. So let's get into my kind of takes as I work my way through this thing. The first thing, the glaring thing that jumps out at you is that there are only 10 games on this list. For those who don't uh, or aren't aware of the math or how, how many regular season games you can have, you can have 31 There are a few loopholes, like if you play at an Alaska school or at a Hawaii school, that's exempt and you can get 32. Obviously, Ohio State's not doing that. Anyway, Big Ten has a 20-game conference schedule, so that leaves you 11 non-conference games. This one's only 10, so we're missing something. Well, when Ohio State put out the schedule, they tweeted, quote, the non-conference schedule is here. We'll have two neutral site games this season with a potential third game to be announced later. So my thought is I'm that, that was the first thing I saw before any media release or anything like that. And I was like, well, they should definitely schedule a third neutral site game. Let's get as many games as we can on this schedule to get as much experience as we can. But Ohio State's press release spoke more definitively to this thing saying, quote, Ohio State will also play in another non-conference neutral site game that we will be announced at a later date. Uh, here's the truth of the matter with that. I, I kind of like the idea of having maybe one slot in your schedule where it's like you get into the season, you see what kind of game you need to help your non-con or whatever, you know, like for mid-majors, and then you schedule it. We got that all the time during COVID. Why not keep it? Anyway, that's not what Ohio State's doing here, but I just like that idea of scheduling at some point, like on a on a short Uh, turnaround or something like that. So we'll see what that uh, 11th non-conference game is. Let's kind of work our way through the schedule a little bit, kind of not necessarily game by game, but just some of the high points here right out of the gate. November 4th, that's a Monday versus Texas in the Hall of Fame series in Las Vegas. Uh, I just want to say right out of the gate, thank you, Hall of Fame series. Thank you to Rodney Terry in Texas. And thank you, um, to Ohio State, uh, really grateful 
to them for doing this. Part of that is we just don't get um, typically good games on the first day of competition. And so this, this game should be the most broadly compelling game of the day because we actually get two power conference schools squaring off against each other. Two power conference schools, by the way, who I think are both going to be pretty good. This is kind of a toss-up game for me. Um, so looking forward to that. There are four total Hall of Fame series events. Uh, the others are in Phoenix and Baltimore and New York City. Also some compelling games in those, so keep your eyes on it. So again, thanks to Coach Dealer, Thanks to Coach Terry for being part of this thing on opening day. My soul needs it. <laughs> And then um, from there, I want to talk about the Texas A&M game that is on uh, Friday, November 15th uh, for a couple of reasons. Number one, I am a big fan, a big proponent of these Friday night games, man. That's an uncharted territory that has, a, and I know we do it during college football season because a lot of, you know, we're not going to steal Saturday from college football. So we get some big time games on Fridays. I wish college basketball did more of this throughout the season, even when football's done. So I love this for being on a Friday night, but also uh, I love these home and home series that are truly on campus. So this is a return game from a home and home that started last year. They played in Columbus, the, the Aggies and the Buckeyes did. And now this game is going to be down in College Station. Should be a lot of fun, uh, really exciting game there. As for the other game against a high major opponent uh, that's not part of a um, neutral site event, that one's against Pitt on November 29th. Um, I tried to see if that was part of a home and home. I can't find any press release about it. So this might just be a one-off, but that would be odd to me. I'm thinking it probably is going to be a home and home, and we just haven't got the, the press release about the return game being at Pitt next year. I, we're starting to see a lot more of this. There are schools getting away from doing as many MTEs. And they will schedule two different home and homes with other power conference schools. And, and it'll alternate where just like this, you're on the road at Texas A&M, but you're home against Pitt. I'm seeing a lot of schools do that. Look, Go look at schools' non-conference schedules. You're starting to see more of this um, popping up. So um, there's that, the A&M game, the Pitt game, a couple other observations. There is no high-level neutral site MTE for Ohio State. Um, a couple things with that, perhaps it's not wanting, you know, uh, not wanting to be part of one with coach dealer, just kind of getting settled in just, Hey, let's ease into this thing, have a couple games against power conference schools, and then we'll get into an MTE next year. So, so there's that speaking of coach dealer, by the way, I love playing Valpo. That's his alma mater, pretty neat stuff. Um, but as you look at this schedule of these 10 games, Seven of them are home games. You've got the one true road game at Texas A&M and then the two neutral site games. I'd like to see teams get out away from home. The Buckeyes get out from Value City Arena uh, more than just three times. I, I personally think that true road games are really important because they get you ready for conference play. Neutral site games are good because they get you ready for NCAA tournament play should you make it there. Um but if you think the seven games for Ohio State's a lot, wait till we get to Colorado here in a second because it's going to get even worse. Um, speaking of that pit game, I love the synergy. That is on November 29th, which is another Friday night. Both of those um, one-off games against Power Conference opponents are on Friday night. That's great, and I love it. But what's really cool is that's Black Friday, the day after Thanksgiving. And then the next day, like that game against Pitt leads into Ohio State and Michigan on Saturday. And so, man, what a just great week for Ohio State Athletics. I, I love that, and I think it's great. As for the Big Ten schedule, we obviously don't have it yet. It's expected to be released sometime around Labor Day, but we do obviously have the opponents and who everyone will be facing. So for Ohio State, both the home and the, the opponents play both home and away are Indiana, Maryland, and Nebraska. Home only opponents, Iowa, Michigan, Michigan State, Northwestern, Oregon, Rutgers, and Washington. And then away only opponents are Illinois, Minnesota, Penn State, Purdue, UCLA, USC. So got to go out west and play both of those schools and Wisconsin. But you notice that both Oregon and Washington are home only. So I think that from what I'm starting to see from the Big Ten as I look at more Big Ten schedules, um, schools are going to one set, but not the other. 
And typically doing both at the same time is what you see there. So Ohio State, uh, probably when we see that Big Ten schedule, I'm guessing they will just stay on the West Coast for both the USC and UCLA matchups, probably paired with a playing partner who flip-flops with them, as the Pac-12 did for so long. As for predicting the record for this non-con schedule, I'm going to go... Um, seven and three on it. Obviously we don't have that 11th game yet to look at. I'm going to say the losses are to Texas A&M. Still got Wade Taylor, the fourth down there. It's always hard to go win on the road. And then I'm actually going to say the Pittsburgh loss. I know Pittsburgh loses Bub Carrington. They lose Federico Federico to transfer portal, but coach Capel's got some really good things going there. Got Jalen Lowe coming back. I think Pitt could come into Value City Arena and win this one. And then the third loss I'm going to say is Kentucky, which is the uh, the Aaron Bradshaw Bowl, right? Uh, uh, Aaron Bradshaw now playing for Ohio State, obviously going up against his former team. That that Texas game to kick off the season is a toss-up for me. I'm going to say Ohio State wins it, though, uh, but watch for that. But, you know, you could flip-flop. I think it's three losses either way. I, I think Texas A&M and Kentucky are the ones I feel strongly about, and then either Texas A&M, or excuse me, Texas or Pittsburgh. So there you go. Ohio State's non-conference schedule. I like it. Uh, a, a nice kind of ease in for Coach Diebler, but also some high-level good games. Now, Colorado's non-conference schedule we're about to talk about, I'm not quite as big a fan of. I'll explain why coming up in just a second. Right after I tell you about game time, going to MLB games in the summer is one of my favorite all-time things to do. The game, the food, the people, everything that's part of the experience. And I love that I've had the opportunity to make some more of those memories even this summer. Maybe you want to too. And thankfully, you don't have to sweat high-priced last-minute tickets because game time is an authorized ticket marketplace of Major League Baseball, which makes getting these tickets faster and easier. In fact, Prices on the Game Time app actually go down the closer it gets to first pitch. With killer last minute deals, all in prices, views from your seat, and their lowest price guarantee, Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying tickets. We just talked about Ohio State and their football team a little bit. How about tickets to their first football game hosting Akron on August 31st? Cheapest ticket to get in the door is $47, but the best deal I found $111 down in 26A, row 31. Go check that out. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the app, create an account, and use code Locked On College for $20 off your first purchase. Again, create an account and redeem code Locked On College for $20 off. Terms apply. Download the Game Time app today. Last minute tickets, lowest prices, guaranteed. We move from Ohio State to Colorado as this team moves back into the Big 12 after spending some time in the Pac-12. And uh, again, for those of you watching on YouTube, I've got the, the schedule pulled up as it comes to us from Colorado on their Twitter account. Let me read it off, though, for those of you who are listening. We start, as most teams will, on November 4th. That's a Monday versus Eastern Washington. And then the um, coming up that Friday, uh, November 8th versus Northern Colorado. Then November 13th versus Cal State Fullerton. Then November 17th versus Harvard. After that, after those four games, head out to Maui, where um, that, that'll be November 25th through 27th. That's Monday through Wednesday of Thanksgiving break for Colorado. The bracket is not out yet, but let me give you the field in alphabetical order. Auburn, these Colorado Buffaloes we're talking about, Dayton, Iowa State, Memphis, Michigan State, North Carolina, and Yukon. As usual, the, the Maui field is very, very good. This is not quite as good as last year, but I mean, it, it's just right there. Last year, I mean, that was the most loaded MTE field I think I've ever seen. And that was even with Chaminade in it last year. Remember, Chaminade only does every other year now. That's why you don't have them in this year. After coming back from Hawaii, Colorado has Pacific on the, on December 2nd, then Colorado State, as always, on December 7th, South Dakota State on December 13th, and then hosting Bellarmine on December 21st. So there you go. That is um, Colorado's 11-game non-conference schedule. Same kind of thing as the Big Ten. The Big 12 has a 20-game schedule, and so 11 games here for Colorado, which have all been filled out, not the whole that Col that uh, Ohio State in theirs. 
So here's where I'm at right out of the gate with this Colorado schedule. The move back to the Big 12 comes with an underwhelming non-conference schedule. Outside of Maui, where they will play some power conference schools, uh, there's literally no other power conference opponents on this schedule. All of the other eight games are against mid and low major schools. It's funny, as you look in the comments on Colorado posting the non-conference schedule, uh, people are enjoying framing this in a variety of different ways. Some are saying it's weak. Others are like, hey, it's it's manageable. And so I like that framing. Uh, whatever you got to do to feel nice about it. Like, here, let me prove it to you with some stats. Outside of the, the Maui field, here's the final Ken Palm ranks of the other eight opponents uh, from last year. And I know it's last year where they're going to be different teams. But it gives you a good idea of where these teams are at. I'll give them to you from highest ranked to worst ranked. Best ranked of these last year was Colorado State, finished 36. From there, it's all outside the top 100, all of the other seven opponents. South Dakota State, 138. Eastern Washington, 152. Northern Colorado, 202. Dalton Connect ain't there anymore. (laughs) Harvard, 228. Cal State Fullerton, 235. Bellarmine, 316. And Pacific, 358. There's only 362 teams in this whole thing, and they were 358. So that means in uh, in Colorado's non-conference schedule for this year, seven of their 11 opponents finished last year outside the top 100 at Ken Palm. Five of their 11 non-conference opponents finished outside the top 200, and two of the teams were in our, outside the top 300. And look, I know the Big 12 caught a bad rap last year for scheduling these weak non-conference schedules. Well, Colorado said, hey, we're moving into the conference. Let us get on. Let us ride in on those coattails. And that's exactly what they've done. This, to me, for Coach Boyle's team, I I know they lose a lot of talent from last year. I I get that, right? Um, Eddie Lampkin is off to Syracuse. And then you got Cody Williams off to the league. KJ Simpson off to the league. De Silva off to the league. All of that. And so I get it. You're starting over. You're bringing in a bunch of new dudes and you, and you got to figure this out. But still, you feel like you got to play some level of power conference schools. And here's the other thing. Literally zero true road games. There's the three neutral games in, in Hawaii. The other eight games are literally all at home. So here's the thing for me. Even if you're not going to play a power conference opponent, at, at least get out and go play somebody at their gym or at maybe even at least more so than that, some other neutral site games back on the mainland. I just, I do not think that this schedule sets you up for success for Colorado. And then I fear, what does that mean? Then you step into big 12 play the best conference in the country and things are not going to go well for Colorado. I'm, I am now officially nervous for how the buffs are going to do this year. So ultimately, I get it though. I understand that this non-conference schedule is a result of moving to the Big 12 and losing a very talented course. So I understand Coach Boyle and the staff's decision in doing this. As for Colorado's um, Big 12 conference opponents, same thing. We don't have the schedule out yet, but we know who they're playing where. Home and away will be Arizona State, UCF, Iowa State, Kansas, and TCU. So that's tough. You got to play both you got to play Ohio State twice. You got to play Kansas twice. Home only is Baylor, BYU, Cincinnati, Houston, and West Virginia. So that's kind of a break. You only have to play Baylor at home, and you only have to play Houston at home. That's a big win for Colorado. Away only is Arizona. That's tough. K-State, that's going to be tough. Oklahoma State, Texas Tech, that's going to be tough. And Utah. So three of these five road-only games are going to be very difficult. And obviously, it's not like Oklahoma State and Utah are going to be straight pushovers, but it's just not as difficult on paper, at least, as Arizona, Kansas State, and uh, Texas Tech. So non-conference prediction for this thing, I'm going with 7-4, and and it's funny because uh, on paper, as you compare that to Ohio State, it's right in the same vicinity, but man, this is just a good reminder of how just looking at win-loss records is not a good thing to do. Because uh, a seven and four non-con for Colorado is not nearly as impressive as the same record would be for Ohio State based on their schedule. 
So, uh, and I think the losses are chiefly going to come in Maui, depending on how the bracket breaks down. I think Colorado will either go 0 and 3 or 1 and 2 there. I'm going to say losing to Colorado State, even though that's at home. And so give me those four losses, Maui and Colorado State for the Buffs. All right, Oklahoma. We talked about them earlier in the week after they had gotten the Jeremiah Fears commitment over the weekend. And then they just keep adding everybody. You know, couldn't couldn't you guys have given us a heads up like, hey, hold off because we got more dudes coming. Now I'm just giving Porter Moser and staff a hard time. It's great news for Oklahoma to get in some more talent. And Leonard Hamilton gets one of his guys to reclass and come right now. We'll talk about all that in just a second. We close out the show today talking Ohio State and Florida State. By the way, I haven't mentioned, thank you so much again for joining us on Locked On College Basketball, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. We've talked about Ohio State today. We've talked about Colorado. We're about to talk about Oklahoma again, and we're about to talk about Florida State. Make sure you go check out all those great shows that are part of the Locked On Podcast Network as well. Got one for all four of those. So, on Saturday last weekend, Jeremiah Fears commits to Oklahoma. So Andy and I on Monday's show talked about the Fears commitment, talked about Oklahoma itself as a team, a little more in depth. So we're not going to do that again. But then here's what happens. That was the Monday show. And then on Monday, Glenn Taylor commits out of the transfer portal to Oklahoma. And then yesterday, Tuesday, Alec Blair, a 2025 um, recruit, commits to Oklahoma to play both basketball and baseball in Norman. Crazy stuff there that you get just this whirlwind of personnel news in late July. How often is that happening? But it's great for Oklahoma and Porter Moser. You love to see it. But isn't that that always how it goes? You talk about a school and then it's like, oh, hold my drink here. Here's a couple more just tidbits of news that you got to get in. So let's take Glenn Taylor and Alec Blair one at a time. Just give you a little bit on them. We're not going to spend a ton of time, but for those who are interested, want to make sure you have it. Glenn Taylor is a St. John's transfer. He has been two years at Oregon State, last year his junior year at St. John's, and now his senior year will be at Oklahoma. He's a 6'6 forward, and last year when he went to St. John's, the numbers just kind of tanked, went downhill. So for example, his sophomore year at Oregon State played 30 minutes a game there in Corvallis. Last year, almost cut in half, 17 and a half minutes um, for Rick Pitino and St. John's. Scoring was down to 4.4 points a game, 2.2 rebounds a game. However, he did for St. John's last year shoot over 40% from 3, 42.4% on 1.8 attempts a game easily a career high in terms of that percentage, but a pretty small sample size, 59 attempts. But here's the weird thing. As the three point percentage went up, the free throw percentage went down from 80% his sophomore year down to 69%. Now that could also be a function of sample size. That 80% his sophomore year was on 156 attempts and then down to just 33 attempts last year. So obviously that plays a role in it. Here's my hope for Glenn Taylor is that this time moving to to Oklahoma can be a fresh start for him, kind of getting back to the production that he had at Oregon State. So we'll keep our eyes out for that. And then Alec Blair, as I said, will uh, come play both basketball and baseball at Oklahoma. He's a year away, though. He's a 2025 guy, so a rising senior in high school. 6'6", small forward from De La Salle in California. You probably know them well for their football team. I love him because he's a lefty. I'm a lefty. I'm a southpaw, so I always get down with my lefty dudes just like me. This guy, what what I really like about Blair as a basketball player specifically, I, I don't know anything about him as a baseball player. He's legit built like a wing, which is what his frame is. But often for De La Salle, if you go watch their tape, watch some of his highlights, you'll see. He is somebody that is entrusted with the ball in his hands to be a playmaker, to be a facilitator, to be an originator, whatever kind (laughs) of playmaking uh, jargon you want to throw at it. You know, we often think about a point forward, kind of a a point small forward. Um, And so that's interesting. So this screams to me, Alec Blair is a mismatch for whoever he's going to be guarding. One thing he does need to work more on this year is the outside shot. But once that thing is going... Man, I think Alec Blair could be a real dude 
um, for Coach Moser here. Now, the thing is, we're going to have to to see which route is the one that he kind of specializes in or spends more time on. Typically, when we get these two sport athletes, yes, they're playing both, but one supersedes the other, whether it's, you know, a guy doing football and basketball and he's more with the football team and then comes to play basketball. So we'll wait to see on that. Just the way things work seasonally, obviously he'll be playing basketball first, but um, we'll, we'll see on all that. Um, what, what I also like about Blair is he's a legit kind of two-way basketball player who, um, according to his high school coach, loves to take the assignment of guarding another team's best player. I like guys with that mentality. They're like, give him to me. I want him, right? Um, but in addition to all that, it's not just the on-court stuff that's going to serve Coach Moser well. Um, it's that he is going to be a great team guy, a great locker room guy. So beyond all the great things he'll do on the court, going to be a great part of this Oklahoma program off of it. Let's switch from Norman, Oklahoma to Tallahassee, where Leonard Hamilton already had a Leonard Hamilton guy, but he's getting him sooner than we thought. Alir Malouk um, was committed to Florida State back last October 20th in 2023, but we got the news on Monday, uh, I saw it first from Joe Tipton, so let me give him credit, that Malouk is reclassing from 2025 to 2024 to come right now. He is a 6'10", 180-pound center. Yes, 180 pounds on a 6'10", dude, is as skinny looking as you would imagine it is. Go check him out. He's one of those, like I was watching it, and my wife was sitting there beside me just watching some of his tape. And I was like, Mag, uh, Maggie is my wife's name. I said, Mag. I feel like he's one of those dudes I could flick and and just like break all his bones. Unfortunately, it's just like a, a chopstick, right? It'd just break in half. I don't want that for him, but uh, gonna need to bulk up. Very spindly, very spindly. Um, he plays Maluk does at Long Island Lutheran there in New York, but is originally from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He's a Pittsburgh guy, but is playing his high school basketball right now in New York. And so, as I said, just. I feel like Florida State always has like 87, 6, 10 or bigger dudes on their roster. And here we go again. But again, got to get in the weight room um, because he's going like uh, we um, I, I talked about Eddie Simpson earlier on the show, who's transferring from Colorado to Syracuse. I said Simpson, Eddie Lampkin. I'm conflating Eddie Lampkin and KJ Simpson. That's hilarious. Eddie Lampkin would just straight up push homie around. That, I mean, that's just how it would go. Um, so I, I, I'm curious to see if and how Florida State will use him this year. Obviously, if they're getting him to reclass, it's because they feel like they need him right now. So I, I expect that we'll see him. And keep in mind, Leonard Hamilton essentially plays all of his guys. And so he's going to certainly get a chance. As a reminder, Jameer Watkins is back for this team. A lot of people thought he'd stay in the draft or transfer out. Even when he pulled out of the draft, I thought for sure he'd go somewhere else, but he's back in Tallahassee. That's massive for the Knowles. Uh, five, five total person freshman class plus three transfers coming in. Justin Thomas, Boston Holt, and Jerry Dang. So I think what, what we learned from that is there's just so much new coming in for Leonard Hamilton. And I know a lot of uh, programs are in that year in and year out right now. Um, but it's just going to have to find a way to bring all these guys together, make them cohesive, find that chemistry, and get things rolling in Tallahassee. Because I really, I really haven't enjoyed seeing Florida State not be what they've been under Lem Leonard Hamilton the last couple of years. Would love to see the Knowles um, get back up near the top of the ACC, play some really good basketball, kind of on the back end here of Coach Hamilton's career. Who knows how many more years he'll do it, but uh, it can't be too terribly many. And would just love to see um, one more just big run to, of success for him. All right, guys, that's it for today's show. If you haven't subscribed to Locked On College Basketball on audio and video, go ahead and do that right now so you don't miss a second. If you're not part of our Locked On College Basketball Discord community already, come on and join us, man. It's free free. You have to pay zero nothing for our discord. The link is in the show notes. Come on in and let's talk college basketball every day. Want to say apologies to the lawyer family. Let's go wildcats. And until tomorrow, peace.